You're listening to an archived Cabral Concept podcast. After listening to this show, check out the most up-to-date podcasts available at stephencabral.com slash podcasts or search directly on iTunes. And now, welcome to the Cabral Concept, where board-certified naturopath and integrative health practitioner Dr. Stephen Cabral shares how he was diagnosed at the age of 17 with a life-altering illness and given no hope for recovery. It was only after studying and traveling all over the world did he discover how to combine ancient Ayurvedic healing practices with state-of-the-art naturopathic and functional medicine to fully rebalance the body and re-energize it with life. It's time to discover how to get well, lose weight, and finally feel alive again. And now, here's your host, Dr. Stephen Cabral. I'm Stephen Cabral, and today on the first house call of the weekend, we're actually going to do a follow-up to start from our last week's show, episode 204, where I gave a bunch of recommendations on how to eliminate kidney stones naturally. So there are, of course, times when you may need actual emergency medical intervention, and you might have to go for a more dramatic solution to your kidney stones. However, it's been my, basically, experience over the past, let's say, five years of being able to help people naturally eliminate and break up their kidney stones whenever I do get asked for those recommendations. So I did provide those in episode 204. I highly recommend checking them out. But before we get into some great questions on nutrition, uh, nutrition and weight loss, and then some anti-inflammatory based foods, I do want to give a follow-up to Danielle, which is, you know, if you get kidney stones, that's one thing. And then of course you need to eliminate them. But how do we not get kidney stones in the first place? We know some people are a little bit more susceptible than others, but that doesn't mean you have to get them. So one thing that I found, and again, there are many different solutions and many different reasons, but one reason why people do get kidney stones is they have too much calcium in their bloodstream and the kidneys are having to filter that excess mineral, that excess calcium. So why would someone have this excess calcium in their bloodstream? Well, it's not from eating too much natural forms of calcium. However, it could be from what we'll call fake nutritional supplement calcium, like calcium carbonate and things like that, really cheap forms that you might get at like your local drugstore or your local supermarket that are not good quality products. I mean, that's one, but that's more rare. The main reason is a lot of times people don't do well under stress, meaning like their body actually starts to pull more calcium into the bloodstream. They become what's called more calcium retentive. So their body actually breaks down some of their own minerals, some of their own bone, and they can pull that into the bloodstream. Now, this happens because calcium is called a vasoconstrictor. So it helps to actually constrict the arteries. It increases blood pressure, and it essentially gets us into that fight or flight base mode. It does increase constriction of the arteries, which gets us ready again for that either fight, flight, or freeze. But the other thing is what's supposed to happen directly after that calcium retention in the bloodstream is that magnesium is supposed to follow behind and it's a vasodilator. So what it does is it actually stops this sympathetic nervous system dominance or this fight or flight based response because we shouldn't be in that, of course, for too long. So what that does is it helps then naturally dilate, naturally relax the body. Well, a lot of people are short in magnesium and high in calcium. I see this all the time on hair tissue mineral analysis. It's literally, I would say it is my favorite lab test to run. And the reason is it's less expensive than all the others and it can give you a wealth of information. I often say to people, you know, if you can only do two functional medicine labs, I would run the organic acid test for digestion, looking at all of your vitamins. And then I would run the hair tissue mineral analysis for your mineral ratios, of course, to see if you're in fight or flight flight to look at how well your body is doing in terms of um, energy balance, adrenal fatigue, those types of things, detoxification and heavy metals. So between looking at the mitochondria, your energy, your vitamins, yeast overgrowth, bacterial overgrowth, dopamine, I mean, you can look at literally everything, serotonin, norepinephrine, it's, those two labs are pretty amazing. But just to look at this high calcium to magnesium, now remember, if you get your hair tissue mineral analysis lab back and you're greater than a 7 to 1 ratio for calcium to magnesium, you have some work to do. And it's actually, it's very simple and it's very straightforward. Magnesium glycinate is my magnesium of choice. Now, sometimes I will use magnesium malate and I'll use different forms as needed, magnesium citrate. But just for general everyday use as a anti-anxiety, as a calming mineral, as a calming of fight or flight, I typically 
do choose the magnesium glycinate. It's also, it's greatly absorbed and it's very easy on the stomach as well. So hopefully that helps with how not to get kidney stones, but obviously not just that. Like when I answer a question on the, on the house call, it's not for one specific type of person. Like these things really can apply to everyone. And that's how you have to look at it, that this isn't just for preventing kidney stones. This is for preventing high blood pressure and constriction of the arteries and all of these different things. So hopefully that helps. Now, next up is Zahar or Zara 1990. And this question is coming from Instagram. And she's asking, are legumes and whole grains really bad for weight loss? So, you know, this is a hard question to answer. And the reason is this, that there are no foods that are necessarily good or bad for weight loss if they're a whole food and if they're it's a natural food. I mean, we can make some cases that, yes, dairy is certainly not going to be a very good one if you're trying to lose weight, and neither is a lot of gluten. We understand those, but those are very common food sensitivities as well, Like just like you wouldn't want to overload on a lot of soy. But you know, when it comes to legumes... Let's throw chickpeas into that mix as well and lentils and black beans and, you know, the common beans that people are eating. So, and then we have whole grains. And when I'm talking whole grains, I'm talking about the gluten-free variety, maybe quinoa, some different type of rice, whether it's black rice, red rice, or uh, again, there's so many different varieties that are very healthy for you. Green rice, I really like that one as well. And then we're looking at things like oatmeal, which I think can be excellent for some people. And same with buckwheat. But the problem is this, that people look at grains and they look at legumes and they see that they're a little higher glycemic. Now, that doesn't mean that they're going to spike blood sugar that high, like something high glycemic. But yes, it's not a protein and it's not a vegetable. So they have the opportunity to spike blood sugar. But what people forget is that it's not just about the glycemic index. It's about the glycemic load of a meal. And it's also about the combining of certain foods. So if we add a little bit of good fat, like avocado or something like that, to our legumes or our whole grains, it's going to greatly slow the digestion and absorption of those carbohydrates or essentially sugars because all carbohydrates, no matter what they are, will break down to some form of sugar. The other thing that people forget is if you have you know, 10, 12, 16 ounces of meat, that's actually going to spike your blood sugar as well. So that has to do with the glycemic load of that meal. Just because something's like not a carbohydrate doesn't mean it won't spike your blood sugar and your insulin. It will. And that's kind of like a new fact that people are just starting to learn about because the gurus, the people who are just looking at like the surface level are not telling you those things. And, and you know, it's really important as well because you can gain weight from eating too much meat, too much bacon, too much sausage, all of those things, because it can actually spike your blood sugar as well. So here's the simplest way. And this is what we do. And again, I'm, I like getting technical. There's no doubt about it, but why not give you a simpler answer? Do what we do in my practice. Do what I've been doing literally for 20 years. You're going to go on an elimination-based plan. You're going to go on a lower glycemic plan. You're going to go on something to regulate your blood sugar, decrease inflammation, and that's typically going to be mainly vegetables for your carbohydrate source. And then you're going to add in some fruit, like veg- some berries and low glycemic-based fruits. And that's typically going to be in the morning for your breakfast, and that's going to be you know post-workout as well. And then after that, like once you've reached the weight that you want, great. Now let's do a little bit of experimentation. But in my opinion, why not do what we know works? Why not do like the simplest thing? Just get to your goal. That's my biggest thing with people is like, don't experiment. We know it works. Get right to your goal. And then after that, I call that the control. We know that works for you. Then we're going to say, okay, I'm now at lunch. I want to experiment with having a half a cup of beans, lentils, chickpeas, hummus, whatever it might be at lunch. And that's going to be the only change for a week. Do you gain weight? Do you stay the same or do you lose weight? That's your barometer right there. If you stay the same or you even lost a little weight, well, then legumes don't cause you to gain weight, right? They might for some people, but they don't for you. That's how we have to look at it is bioindividuality. But bioindividuality is really simple to figure out. It honestly is. I mean, I love running lab tests and you can learn so much from them and I would not have recovered like I did without running lab tests. So I'm not going to discount them. However, there's a lot of things you can do first to also start to get yourself well and lose the weight. So hopefully that answers your question. And of course, I'm happy to always follow up on that as well. And the last question is coming in from Tom. Tom is asking, should everyone stay away from nightshades? Okay, so this is an excellent question as well. And a lot of people don't know what nightshades are. So I'd like to explain exactly what they are first and then say if we should be staying away from them or not, because it is getting to be a hot topic. Okay, so essentially nightshades are a particular type of botanical family or plant-based family. Most People know that tomatoes and peppers and potatoes are part of this particular nightshade family. But what you, so, and the other thing too is no one knows exactly how the term essentially night 
shade came about. But the nightshade, so when you think of nightshade family, a lot of them have particular berries that are actually poisonous. And when we're lumping them all together, nightshades, I'm going to give you a list in one second, can cause a lot of inflammation in some people. And this inflammation has been linked to circulatory issues, heart-based issues, autoimmune issues, inflammatory skin-based conditions, joint pain. So it's pretty severe with a lot of people. And I'm going to answer whether everyone should stay away from them or not in just one moment. Here are some of the nightshades and a lot of them that you may not even know about. But ashwagandha, so really popular herbal-based adaptogen that helps reduce stress. It's actually an, an amazingly powerful adaptogen, great for the adrenal glands and great for calming stress, but a lot of people are sensitive to it. So bell peppers or sweet peppers, tomatoes, gooseberries, so sometimes called um, Indian gooseberries, things like that as well. And let's see, what else? Some forms of cacao, eggplant, huckleberry, goji berries, hot peppers, essentially think pop peppers on almost all varieties, paprika, not sweet potatoes, but regular potatoes, and tomatoes. Those are the main ones right there. So what you want to think about is what I just named off are really healthy foods for the most part. So, and a lot of people do benefit from them. That's why I don't have people eliminate nightshades unless I suspect that they can be causing people issues. So I can eliminate every single thing from someone's diet in the beginning. Like I can't eliminate, let's say, high salicylates, high FODMAP, high nightshade, high histamine, like then some, literally there'll be nothing to eat left, high oxalate. So what I do is I start with a, a very strong and great elimination-based plan. What I do is I eliminate the top five food allergens. And then I expect people to pretty much see great results within 21 days. That's my control. And then if I don't, then I say, okay, now we need to customize this even further for this person. And then we'll start taking out histamines or we'll start taking out, like if they still have joint pain after 21 days and it's still pretty strong, of course, I'm going to take out nightshades at that time as well. But I'd rather not. Like I don't want to take everything out of a person's diet. So my answer to you then, uh, Tom, is simply this, is that there's no need to eliminate things like these really powerful and healthy foods like tomatoes. Like tomatoes are high in lycopene and and they have great, amazing antioxidants and phytonutrients in them. So don't eliminate them unless you need to. Um, So hopefully that answers your question. I just know it's been getting really popular. Our community member, Tom, came up with this question. Actually, it's funny because when he asked it, I was thinking Tom Brady because Tom Brady, I'm obviously a huge New England Patriots fan living in Boston, always have been. And Tom Brady is completely nightshade free. He said he doesn't have any issues with nightshades he doesn't believe, but he just doesn't want to take the chance. You know, he's approaching 40. In my opinion, a lot of people's opinion, the best quarterback, greatest quarterback to ever play the game. And he's decided that he's going to stay on elimination diet for the most part. He's going to eliminate uh, nightshades as well. And it's obviously and clearly working for him. You don't have to take it to his level. You might not have a private chef like he does. But so what I'm saying is you don't need to eliminate them unless you believe it is actually causing you an issue. Hopefully that answers your question. And once again, thank you everyone for tuning into the Cabral Concept. I'm going to be back tomorrow answering more of your questions and hopefully I'll get to talk with you then. Take care. I want to sincerely thank you for your support of this podcast. I couldn't do it without you, and I mean that. I truly do. I also want to make sure you knew that we now have multiple ways for you to find your answers to the most difficult health, wellness, weight loss, and anti-aging questions. You can find podcast-specific topics like thyroid, adrenal, hormones, sleep, digestion, Ayurveda, and many more at stephencabral.com forward slash podcasts that will then link you to your favorite Apple, Spotify, and other podcast players. Plus, all new podcasts and weekly exclusive video content is being added to our YouTube channel at youtube.com forward slash Stephen Cabral. And that's Stephen with a PH. Head on over and subscribe so that you don't miss any of the exclusive content. Lastly, if you've ever found any of my podcasts or books to be helpful, I would really appreciate it if you could leave a review on iTunes or your favorite media player for the podcast. Rating and subscribing to the YouTube and podcast allow me to reach more and more people and help spread my mission of healing throughout the world. Thank you again for being a part of this movement.